My name is David Lankus. I'm the Virginia and Charles Bowden Professor of Librarianship at the University of Texas at Austin, which is a lot of words, but it, what it really means is my job is to make sure that we take the resources of the University of Texas to connect into the library community, support the library community, and be an active part of the library community. So I'm very thankful to the organizers and the information today for having us here today. Um, with that, I'm going to be presenting uh, with our head of policy for this project. His name is Riley Lankus, and the name is not coincidental, but if there's any nepotism occurring, it's on this side. So he's bringing me up to date. Uh, I want to talk to you today about a project we have ongoing, um, and there's a whole track around AI. I'm assuming that you've had a lot of how the AIs are working. Have I could have a really sort of show of hands. How many people have either generated an image, Dali, whatever it is, or generated some responses via chat GPT? Just, okay. So I, we're not going to spend a lot of time on how-tos. We're figuring you're getting that. Where this project comes from, well, let's start with a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to give you an overview of the project, which is the State Libraries and AI, uh, State Libraries and AI Technologies, or SLATE project, where it's coming from, who's supporting it. We're going to talk a little bit about AI in general, but then we're going to get into how we're helping structure the conversation for these state libraries. Um, thank you very much. So we're going to talk about how uh, we've, we're having a conversation around the themes of dreaming, dreading, and destroying. Um, not necessarily in that order. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some specific issues that are part of this conversation. The hope is that we can say, once again, what this sector is doing, and also we can provide input and have insight in what you may be doing in these different projects. So with that, uh, I'm going to just start with a little bit of the project, which is one could really worry if AI is the buzzword of the day and next year after all the court sessions happen and ChatGPT is dismantled or not, whatever, is this going to go away? Do we have a time, um, I was working with a biologist, we were working on image production. So we were working in Dali, we worked at a couple, of, he said, I said, give me something that you would use in a classroom. And he did, there were lots of words. There was a try something or other, it was very interesting. Um, and he said, all right, put that in. This, this sort of, this chemical bonding with this chemical, and it generated image, and he looked at the image and said, yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, and then, oh, that's pretty, but no. And um, what's interesting also is that the, it would start with this long text response of, if you're looking at transcription of DNA to RNA, it's like, well, this is what it is, and here are the steps, and he goes, yep, that's right, and here's the image. He goes, I don't know what that is. So we're in this situation where we're all trying to find what it can do and what it can't do, what the different areas are. But, what I want to say, the, the, the loop there, if you're not familiar with it, take the time to find something called the Gartner Group's Hype Cycle. Gartner Group is an industry consulting group. They uh, look at the standard dissemination of innovation, so the idea that back in the day of uh, Everett Rogers, where they would talk about things like you have the innovators and the early adopters, the early majority, and he has this nice little bell curve. Well, what uh, Gartner Group developed and discovered is that's not how it works on many technology projects. And they came up with this hype cycle. They said, you sort of have these ideas and people murmur about it and then the expectation grows and then it's going to change the universe as we know it and then life is cured and then life doesn't get cured and so it then goes down. And they call this the hype, the height of expectation, the trough of disillusionment. I love the trough of disillusionment where it's nothing. And then it reaches the plateau of productivity. That is, people find its real use. And, if, and I know it's really tiny, but it will not surprise you to say that the very top of the hype cycle is generative AI, right? It's what we're talking about. It's what people think is going to tell them. But here's the thing. If you just follow generative AI, if you just look at ChatGPT and OpenAI and all this other stuff, you may really wonder, is this a fad or not? But what, I, what we're doing when we're looking in these projects and working with our partners is AI is already here. It may not be generative AI, but your search results are being controlled by AI. We've moved away from deterministic algorithms. When Facebook is going to show you what the next ad is, there's no one who can walk through the decision steps and the data points to predict what's going to happen. They're now using these inductive systems and, frankly, statistical probabilities to generate it. The next song you hear on Spotify comes from three AIs working on the sound, how the music sounds, what sounds like it, who will like this song that you may be like, your profile management, and natural language processing that's looking at the lyrics, it's looking at social media posts, it's looking at all this information. 
That influences what you hear next. We know that in job applications, 70, uh, let's see, 2016, Oh, 78% of applications to the Fortune 500 were never seen by a human being. So we already see that AI is here. So when we're looking and talking with our partners about AI, yes, generative AI is part of that discussion, but we are know that already it's influencing the communities in the states that they're trying to serve. And so we're looking broadly around that issue. So we know that when we're talking about AI, we're talking about machine learning, AI techniques, they're already there. Your fitness trackers and number of steps is based on AI. Your intelligent cruise control is based on AI and such. So we want to look across that area. I want to give a shout out to the 14 state library agencies that are working with us. Texas, Georgia, Iowa, New Jersey, Colorado, Washington, Hawaii, Delaware, New York, North Carolina, Arizona, Tennessee, Michigan, and Ohio. And what's great about working with these 14 libraries is they represent broad strats from the developed Northeast to the very rural Midwest. Um, and there's an old joke that says, once you know one state library, you know one state library. They're very diverse. Um, so what we know is the state library agency, if you're not familiar with it, they're uh, set up within state government. They, uh, they have many different jobs, but primarily they take the federal investment through something called the Library Services and Technology Act, which is a block grant. They match that to the state, and then they determine within the state how they're gonna use it. Georgia, for example, has a relatively small staff, no public face, and it's all about public librarianship and doing programming and grants. Texas, on the other hand, not only does it have a large public access library, but the archives of Texas. So if you want to hear about Texas Rangers, you can go find hear about Texas Rangers, um, as well as being the government documents repository for the state government, right? So they vary on very broad topics, but all of them came together and said, AI, what are we going to do about it? And they want to be proactive. Some of them are looking at this as a way for libraries to jump ahead in sectors and build greater confidence. Some of them are really worried. Um, New Jersey and uh, Delaware are working on new digital literacy initiative and fluency competencies. How is this going to affect things? So we're looking across a broad spectrum. The goal of the overall three goals of the project, the first is to better equip these state library agencies to proactively respond to opportunities and perils of AI. Is this, for example, one of the things that we're going to look at, well, I'll talk about in a moment. Second is to provide insight and participant-specific ideas for projects and applications because they're so different. The goal isn't to come up with one report saying state library shall, but to have state libraries have these commonalities, but Iowa should and, and North, North Carolina should. And finally, to better position state library agencies in growing efforts for AI workforce development and in their own outreach and support mission. I'll be really brutal. One of the conversations we've had is the notion of how we can change narratives from book banning and challenges to the notion of workforce development to focus not just on the small bit of the controversy on one services that library offers, but the larger community gains. And the, the example we give is it's really hard for state legislatures to say those liberal grooming pedophile librarians do a great job preparing tomorrow's workforce for AI. So if we could talk about different narratives that we can push in and, and move ahead, that's important as well. So let's get down to how we're doing it and some of the issues that we're talking about. As you've seen, AI, because it's trendy and it's a word, though I would argue it's been a 10-year trend and we've only begun to see now with generative AI what the applications and implications are. As we look at this, it can go in lots of different ways. We just heard a keynote from Library of Congress where they're looking at, can we use this to create bibliographic records or enhance bibliographic records? Can we use this to take our archives of cultural heritage manuscripts and materials and remix them? Can we use it to do archive work, et cetera? It's all over the, the place. And so rather than just say, hey, AI, because we know that that is not actually a helpful term once you get into it. Does that mean AI is in machine learning, uh, creating uh, neural networks, talking about data mining techniques, or is this how do we use it to create marketing um, materials that are copyright free? Right? All across the board. So rather than just getting lost, as one can get lost, I can show you my archive of like 300 AI images just because it's fun. That's how I doodle now, just to go in and say, oh, what does a cow look like emerging from an elephant graveyard? Oh, okay. Um, we can get to that later. 
What we're doing is we're going to into each of our partners and we're identifying their strategic priorities. And one of the things that we've seen with libraries is there's a great, we'll just, we'll just, sorry. what we've seen on the libraries is um, there's a great interest, but we've also seen a great necessity of strategic alignment, strategic planning. Strategic planning is really beginning to evolve as we're seeing, not just in the idea of what are our major outcomes, but how do we evaluate and gather data? And what I find really fascinating is co-developing strategies with communities and looking at community impact more so than outputs of a strategy. So following that trend, we're trying to look at strategic priorities. So we go into a state library and we say, all right, what are your strategic priorities? That may come from your LSTA plan. Each one of these state libraries, and by the way, there are 54 of them, which is interesting counts. Um, Washington DC is a state, the public library of DC is the state library for the district. Do I have any Washington DC district? Congratulations. So tell me if I get this wrong. Um, but Guam, uh, et cetera, right? So there are other territories. Um, but each one of them has to put together every five year a plan on how they're going to spend the federal portion of their budget called the LSTA plan. So that might be what they're looking at. Um, every five years they have to go through an evaluation process. How are they doing on this topic? So is that where it's coming from? Some of them may have their own agency plans where they've developed them within it, very similar to what the Library of Congress did for the Library of Congress. But several of them are working on state strategic library plans. For example, the State Library of Iowa was very interested in joining up because the governor has just announced a statewide AI initiative and platform. And we're seeing this, and, and uh, Riley can talk a little bit about this. We're seeing that the policy movement, the, the, the law, the, the way that we're trying to control this is happening at the state level, not the federal level. At the federal level, there's lots of hearings and discussions, but then there's the federal level. And so we're seeing state levels and county levels and cities putting together new policies, new initiatives, new strategic plans around AI. And so it makes the position of these state library agencies crucial. They are at once a public institution. They are part of the state government, usually on the executive branch, not exclusively. Some of them are directly involved in the operations of state government. I mentioned Texas, for example. Um, and so they have this sort of state government look. On the other hand, they're tied, all of them are tied directly to public, academic, and school libraries throughout the state. So if we can begin to look at intelligent policy and talk about how different services may interact at a state library, we can begin to connect that into what's happening in large urban libraries. And one of the special interests we have are rural library settings. Rural libraries just don't have the resources and necessarily the agency to go and have these conversations. Rural libraries are also extraordinarily diverse. In South Carolina, they are based at the county level. In Texas, they're, it's literally the wild, wild west where you can just say, I'm a library today. Or you can be a public library where you get some funds from your city. Some of them are seen as charities. Some of them have, in Georgia, you have to have a Master's of Library Science to be a library director until the new law gets passed, but we'll avoid that for a moment. Um, in Texas, you don't. And over 50, under 50,000, there's no requirement for graduate or professional degrees to be library directors or library staff. So we have this great diversity. How can state libraries bring the kind of resources we need for being strategic and talking about how do they come up to speed, what kind of services can they use, et cetera. So each of these is going to be unique. All of this is happening not as a bunch of people in Texas sitting amongst ourselves having, a, having an intelligent conversation, often intelligent, not always, um, but we're having a conversation among the state libraries. The goal of this is to bring the state library staff together to have a conversation about where they want to go. We know if we get enough librarians in a room and we tell them to have a conversation on a topic, they will, regardless of what they know about the topic. Right? Now, there will be a lot of searches. There will be a lot of reading and bibliographies built. This, what we're seeking to do is have an informed conversation. So throughout the six months, it's a six month period starting February 1st, 
what we're doing is informing, experimenting, et cetera, but for the whole six months, having this conversation so at the end of the day, they feel like they can make some informed decisions. The way we're structuring this conversation, as I mentioned first, we're doing it around the um, strategic plans, but thanks to Stacy Aldrich, who's the State Librarian of Hawaii, yes, there will be a site visit, um, she had a great way of thinking about this. Because when we talk about this, we can't just like say, okay, AI, go. How do we structure this conversation? Because particularly right now, when um, we're trying to keep up with the literature, every two days there's a new article, there's a new research report, there's a new congressional pronouncement. How do we have this? And she thought, and I, my words, but her ideas, we need to have a group that dreams. This is the AI will change the world. AI is fundamentally changing society. If you were here for Lee Rainey's discussion yesterday morning, he's done a fantastic report. I think Riley's gonna talk about it briefly. Um, and it was like, okay, society will change. Our faces will melt. It'll be all great. We need a group to have the dread. We need to have that group that talks about the, um, one of the things we're doing is having conversations with people impacted. And I have a, 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 a former classmate of mine who's an illustrator. She has her master's of library science and she's an illustrator. She has very specific and very not complementary concepts around generative AI and mid-journey and these kinds of things. Those are voices that need to be brought in. So we need to have the dread. And it's not necessarily the overlords will, you know, Skynet's coming, but we need to talk about 65, uh, predicted 85 million, 85 million person job loss by 2026. We need to talk about the potential deprofessionalization of different areas. We need to talk about hallucinations and mis and disinformation. We need to talk about that. And then finally, the destroy is not quite as violent as it sounds. That's a group that tries it. This is a group that plays, that sees what it can and can do. This is the one who sits down with the biology teacher and says, will this help you teach biology? And the answer is absolutely not, right? Let what can it do, what can it do? We're gonna show some examples. So what we're gonna do for the rest of our time here together is we're gonna break this down and talk about some inputs to these conversations just as a way of priming it. And so we'll start with dreaming. And with that, one of the things that we're talking about is okay, what kind of dreams can we have what this might this look like? And one of the areas that we're discussing is what about a public AI infrastructure? What if we looked at a distributed hyperlocal network of human expertise, i.e. librarians, and computing power to support large language models, machine learning capabilities, AI audits, training, and action on disinformation and misinformation? What if instead of trust me, trust me, we built it and we could provide that structure in? Now this has policy aspects and it has library aspects, so at this point, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna ask Riley to come up and have a conversation about some of the issues uh, on the policy side. Thank you very much. So when we're sitting down with these state libraries we're working with, a lot of our job here is to be almost an extension of these institutions. You know, we've partnered with 14 of them and a lot of them are coming to us with personnel saying we wanna be a part of this conversation. But one of our other roles is to almost serve as an extension of them. They don't really have the resources in a lot of cases to be thinking proactively about AI and devoting all this time to figuring out how is this going to affect us, what issues are going to be facing our communities, and how can we get out ahead of them. And so one of these conversations we've been having with our partners is about corporate ownership of AI. This is something that's come up in discussions, again, if you were at Lee Rainey's talk yesterday. One of the papers that he recently published came out of Elon. Um, looking at predictions from a bunch of experts about what AI is going to look like by 2040. So we went through that report internally and, and found that one of the major themes was there's a lot of concern about the fact that ownership and control and development of AI is very much concentrated in corporate spaces. A handful of tech giants control the computing resources needed to develop AI. So these companies have control over everything you need to develop your own models and it's so concentrated in that space we're worried about what it's going to look like in the future. AI systems might be designed in that case to serve corporate interests because they're the ones developing them. They have the resources, the ownership, and the control. And this can lead to, as we've seen experts predict, heightened levels of inequality. Um, as new AI models are coming out, these are gonna be designed to serve profits, not people, so we're worried about that. We're worried about a death of privacy as you know, all of our personal data is fed into these behind the scenes AI. Things people don't know are there, they're not quite as visible as the generative models and chat GPT. You know, it's going to become 
a post-privacy era where all of your data is fed into this and, and used to advertise to you better and sell you products. Um, this also, my background is in international politics, so excuse me for starting with the dread side here, but presents a threat to democracy. You know, as, as people are you know, living in these worlds where a lot of content is AI generated, as people have imagined, um, we're going to start to see that concentration of power in those spaces of people who control these models that give you information about the world around you, influencing your worldviews. And then there's a lot of concern over this really concentrated um, control over what you see, what you read, and how you perceive the world around you. So this is where the dream comes in. We want a public AI infrastructure. And again, in that report I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people saying just about the same thing. There was another report recently that came out of Brookings um, calling for this sort of public infrastructure. So we're having conversations in this space with our partners, but also looking broader to see what people are calling for. And we like this one. The goal is to democratize the technology. You know, we want to distribute these benefits to everyone. That way, AI is not that concentrated sort of corporate space, but something that everyone can access, something everyone can learn and benefit from. We want to inspire innovation at the ground level. Um, we want to increase equality, not decrease it. Uh, this public infrastructure should allow universal access, so everyone can use AI. Everyone is familiar with what tools are out there, how they can benefit them. If you're a teacher, if you're an artist, well, we'll see about the artists. Um, and we want to force these big tech companies to compete. Like we said, we don't want that concentrated power all in one space. So we brought this conversation to a lot of our partners, and, and one of the interesting things we've come up with is, okay, this is great, we like this idea, how are we going to do it? There are calls out there for establishing new government agencies. If you're looking at any of the action on the federal level, oh, we need this AI agency, you know, we need this to educate people, bring this technology to the people. And we stopped and said, wait, we might have something for that. And you think of any institutions that are rather trusted, accessible to the public, full of information professionals out there that might already have spaces people can come into and play with this technology. And I just have to say one thing really quickly. We do not represent the policy of any of our partners. These are conversations that we're having. So when we say we want, I just want to be really clear, we want. But uh, so, feeding the conversation. But why libraries? Why not a federal agency here, et cetera? And the answer is, one, distributed and hyperlocal. We know that when you're building infrastructure, having many players actually in library land is beneficial. We've seen that with distributed collection development. We've seen that with distributed reference services. And hyperlocal in that we can talk about how these systems can be trained, can be geared, can be brought into line with very local communities. Because we're not just talking about the state library agencies, but obviously the network of libraries that we represent. Content. We see huge bodies of content to train these systems with, and we understand how copyright and licensing works while the different uh, systems come out. We can provide access and training. Points where people can not only get access to these tools and try these tools, but then get direct support on these tools, training, and access. This is what we were built to do. And we have a long history of providing this kind of technical infrastructure. Libraries not only are social infrastructure, they're content infrastructure that has durability past any given institution's remit. So that's an example where we're talking about what other ideas can we dream about? What other things could better position libraries within this area? What other things like workforce development? Can states help organize where local entrepreneurs can get access to mentors working through their local library to get resources, connecting them into community colleges to get basic instruction, and then bringing it into university level where research is occurring on this, and then contacting and working within the professional areas so that libraries can be the join of preparing workforce for this different technology. What's the, will that work everywhere? Probably not. How, what are the limitations? The conversations we want to have. So this is our blue sky. This is where we get to sit back and be optimistic. Um, we enjoy. I think oftentimes with technology, we don't take enough time to be optimistic these days, primarily because we've been beaten down every time we try it. But we're going to try again. It'll be fine. Which brings us to dread, uh, living, living in the uh, living in the shadow of a technological era. And so with this, I'm going to ask Riley to come up to talk once again about uh, his particular area, and that's the notion of corrosive AI. How, what's AI's impact going to be on democracy and trust? I'll go this way. So we've seen predictions for years that, that 
the generative AI is going to erode trust. This is a really popular idea, right, when AI became very, very popular, that we're going to be living in this post-information age where no one can tell what's real, but the verb they used was always erode. It was going to take time. And so this started as a research project for me last year, um, saying, okay, what if it's not slow? A lot of the indication we've seen and then the movement we've seen in the, the tech sector is that AI development is happening very, 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 very quickly. And it's not just the development that's happening quickly, it's deployment to users. And I'll get into this in a little more detail in a bit, but you know, all of these new innovations are being pushed out with very little testing. We are seeing you know, iteration to AI image generators very quickly with very little thought given to how this is going to affect society. We saw a very similar thing sort of with our first contact, as I heard someone describe it, um, with social media. That was put out there, um, given to the public to play around with, and not much thought, at the beginning at least, was given to how is this going to affect us, what might be the negative effects we're going to experience. And so this is why we were using the word corrode, um, being specifically that the misuse of generative AI is rapidly going to corrode trust in our political institutions, in the figures occupying them, and then eventually in our democracy as a whole. Um, and I want to take a minute to, to specify that it's not going to be the technology itself. This is a trouble you get into a lot where people say AI is going to end the world. Not necessarily. That's not what we're worried about. We're worried that the misuse of generative AI is going to lead to this downfall of trust in our public institutions. So what makes AI corrosive? Well, there are three factors we've identified that sort of contribute to this nature of, of corrosive AI. The first of them, as I mentioned previously, is this rapid deployment and development model. In the corporate, those corporate spaces, we see AI being developed very, very quickly. And I'm talking here mostly about these generative models. But we are being treated as the beta testers, us as the end users. So once new innovations are made, they're pushed out there. It's this AI arms race that's going on that, you know, to capture the space, to be able to get that market share and, and that use from all of us users, they need to push these innovations out as quickly as possible. Um, and a lot of cases, this predominant business model is leading to us becoming guinea pigs. You know, us as the end users are the ones that are testing out a lot of these new features without a full understanding of how that's going to affect our trust in things. Um, this leads to the second factor, uh, damage to trust in video content. So video, until very recently, was perceived as authentic. It was a representation of the world as it is generally. And I'm seeing some head shakes, but that was sort of the, the opinion that we found, at least in my field in political science, um, that the public has of it. You know, you can generally trust that a video was very hard to doctor. So most of the time, if it looked convincing, it was real. We're living now in a world where that is not the case. With the recent release of Sora, again, pushed out to the public, it's an excellent AI generator that can make these incredible, very real looking videos accessible to anyone. Um, now that trust in video, our prediction is it's going to, to degrade. And again, I'm getting in trouble, you're saying our, this is a conversation we're having internally, you know, bringing to our library partners and going, okay, this is you know, some research we've seen out there, what do we think of this? Uh, the third factor I wanted to talk about was this capability to empower disinformation. So another reason AI can sort of corrode public trust is because now disinformation is very, very easy to generate. Anyone with an internet connection has access to a lot of AI tools, and, and a recent study I saw um, tested this in a very sort of operational way. We're going to generate a bunch of AI propaganda that mimics the real thing. We're going to give it to a test group and see how convincing it is. When they just generated that propaganda as it came out, it was slightly less convincing than the real thing. And they've held examples from Russia, from North Korea, um, putting it out there and doing a side-by-side -side test. When you then spend about 15 minutes with someone who knows what they're doing editing it, it becomes slightly more convincing than the traditional propaganda. And so that's, that's a scary thought, that we live in this age where you can generate that content that is very hard to identify very, very quickly. And that's just on the text side. You add in the image side to that, the video, and you're starting to see why trust in public institutions might corrode. You, know, you have this ability to generate scandals wherever you are. We know those are very, very damaging to public trust. Um, now that that's empowered by AI, are we going to see a breakdown in public trust? So we're not entirely sure about that yet. Like I said, this is, this is rather new, but this is one of those conversations we're having with our library partners. Okay, we have this idea of corrosive AI. We have this out there and, and predictions that it might start eroding public trust in institutions and in government. Libraries are a part of that. How can we get out ahead of this issue? How can we solve this? And how can libraries contribute to 
maybe increasing trust in government, making people feel more sure that the content they're seeing and consuming is real. So we think libraries have a large role to play in this. So as we're, we're you know, dreading the future and this AI apocalypse we're, we're potentially heading towards, we're asking our partners, okay, what can we do about this? We're in a really good situation here. How can we help? I'll hand it back over for our, our third pillar of this destroying. So this is, this is the fun part. This is, this is where we get to go and hack systems. I mean, this is old school librarianship. This is when I taught reference 30 years ago. We said, all right, let's go do our Boolean queries and see how well our databases respond, right? There's an equivalent of that. It's when, let's try these things and see what they can and cannot do. Because honestly, I'm enamored, and I think AI is, is already replaced our infrastructure. I think generative AI has great opportunities we're gonna talk about in a moment. But what are those? And so this is, once again, where I remind you that we are a partnership of people having it. So Michael Bushman, who's currently uh, at the uh, Washington State Library, did something. Washington State Library, he took, um, if you're familiar with ChatGPT, it has a paid tier. And one of the trends we're seeing, we're building a petting zoo for all our participating folks, is that there is a baseline free version and then there's the you pay for version. And the you pay for version is significantly better. It's more up to date and has more capabilities. For example, you can go to DALI or Microsoft Image Creator and you can put in a query and it can make an image. If you pay, you can actually then have a conversation. I need an image for story time. Boom, pretty image. Add magical elements. Okay, I need a more diverse audience. Now let's have the parents in it. That kind of conversational function, you're going to pay for. And we're seeing that premium. And one of the questions we have for libraries is, do we look at this as how we look at our collections? Do we pay for access to the premium for our communities, et cetera? But one of the things you can do is take ChatGPT, the language model, and make your own. They call them custom GPTs. And you can take your own knowledge base, your own data, and feed it into it. So Michael and his group at, at Washington State took it uploaded about 30 spreadsheets they keep about all their library statistics and data circulation, all the information they have to collect. They threw it in and said, let's see what happens. And so um, I know it's itty bitty text, so just stick me for a moment. He put in about 30 spreadsheets of all their data. And he asked the question, to, um, could you analyze circulation trends in the Washington State Library from 2020 to 2023? So it says to analyze the circulation trends, I used, uh, reviewed available data, provided materials. Here's a summary of what I found. Number one, shift to digital media. There was a significant increase in circulation in digital media, including ebooks and audiobooks during the period. The surge in digital media usage began in, shocking, 2020, um, likely a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to lockdown restricted access, blah, blah. Second, Graduated, uh, gradual recovery of physical circulation. The circulation of physical books and other materials experienced a sharp decline in 2020 due to the pandemic. However, as restrictions eased, the libraries adopted with measures that cut um, curbside pickup, et cetera. It came up with eight different findings. I don't, enough text. And then ends with, the trend suggested transformation in how users interact with library services, emphasizing the importance of digital media and online access. Libraries may need to continue adapting their strategies to balance between physical and digital services, address the digital divide, and meet the evolving needs of their communities. One of the things that we are seeing in library after library is we have a lot of data lying around um, we're working with the Austin Public Library on another project. Austin Public Library says, we collect data. So we have a program, we go in, and we give you counts. Normally counts are like, eh, it looks about 50, right? And then we ask the librarians to collect anecdotes. Was this good? Write down anecdotes. But they don't. And when you ask them why not, they say, what is the use? We don't use it, we don't get it back, we don't see it. Now with things like using GPTs and large language models, you can imagine these librarians being able to go in and say, hey, what programs got the best reaction? Which programs did people respond to about their children? Which programs did, we can, instead of talking about data mining and having to write reports to the data warehouse, we can talk about anyone having a conversation with their data and generating these human-like responses. One of the questions was, could we then make that data available to the community? And interesting conversations, which is if you took all the library data you had, put it into some sort of easy to use repository, what stories would it tell? 
And one of the concerns of the library was it wouldn't necessarily tell the whole story. For example, if you're a book banner, you may want to know how many times this one book circulated, right? But it doesn't tell you the larger context of how it fits into a collection development, what's its needs, what's its utilization, was it part of programming? And so one of the questions is as we begin to inform and build these kinds of easy to converse with systems, what stories do we want to tell? What stories do we report? Do we begin to put curbs on the responses or not? And is that acceptable or not acceptable? So that brings us to the issue of sort of the call to action, which is we're a month and a half into a six month project and I'd, I will be happy to come back or watch us, I'll have a link at the end to watch what we're coming up with. All this is gonna be publicly available and shared, it's an open conversation. But what, are we going, what do we look at as the potential with AI? And one of the things that we're finding again and again comes to something very core to what libraries have done, whether in the corporate sector, the public sector, the government sector, is storytelling. Once again, uh, in a law library, you say, well, what, there's better not be storytelling. Well, that's called the theory of the case. What is the theory and the narrative that fits in the fact that it brings to your systems, right? We tell stories, we build stories, we ground stories. One of my good friends, Kim Silk, had a great line, which was, uh, data makes stories real, stories make data matter. We see this, and what we're seeing now is with the ability with some of these generative AI systems to gather data that are produced by the non-generative AI systems, machine learning systems, and change how we do storytelling. And what we're seeing is that the libraries writ large is how can we unleash the stories of our community? How can we take marginalized populations, whether that's because they're in rural with low access, whether it's because of an ethnic group, whatever it is, how can we have them tell their authentic stories? Which turns into questions like ethical AI and representational AI and the idea that, you know, we saw with Gemini, with Google's image generator, they had to take it down because, you know, suddenly they were able to produce images of black Nazis that were able to undo and undermine conversations about authentic questions of racism and its destruction. How do we tell these stories? Back to my illustrator friend, what we know with generative AI is it makes pretty pictures quickly, but it's not very good at specific pictures, right? If you, I once asked it, I, I should bring up the image, but I'm not going to. I asked it to like, could I use generative AI to do my Christmas card this year? And I said, you know, husband, bald, glasses, beard. You know, beautiful wife, always beautiful wife. You know, Italian, about that high two children in front of a tree. And it was like two guys with beards and three kids, and you're like, it can't even count. How is it that AI can't even count, right? So we're not to the point where, you know, photography didn't replace painting, it changed, et cetera. But that's a conversation to be had. And it all comes around to this notion of how can we help tell the story? How can we tell the story about the impact the library is having in a community? How can we go to the District of Columbia and say, because we have these funds from the federal authorization, we are allowed to do this and this, and the, the most powerful thing is this person's life was improved, this situation was improved. How can we use this technology to unleash stories? And then the question is, ethically, how can we use this technology efficiently? If we, how can we worry about influence and corporate influence in that storytelling? How can we begin to create systems so that we can unleash what is an amazing technological shift to the population. So, last thing and then I'll shut up. I was, I'm old enough to have been around in 1997, working when the World Wide Web, World Wide Web started in 92, but in 1997 was the time when Pepsi put a URL on its can. And I had so many people ask, like, what the hell does Pepsi need a website for? Why would we do that, right? In 1997, we began the year asking, are we going to be a web world, clearly developed, world in the news, you know, or we're going to still be a fax world, where the web's interesting and fun, but all the business is going to happen on our internal data nets and faxing back and forth. By 1998, it was no longer a conversation. We were a web world. Then it, it turned from, does your library have a website to, your library doesn't have a website? Right? That cognitive switch is where we are with AI. Frankly, it's already changed the, inf we look at the internet as if it's a search and web thing. I go to a search engine, I find a web page but the search engine using AI. 
The web page was generated with AI. It may look the same and feel the same, but it's now fundamentally different infrastructure. The same thing that created black Nazis is determining what you find when you put in a search engine. And we're talking about creating tutors in college and elsewhere, the same systems that are teaching are the same systems that hallucinate. But we're adopting, as Riley pointed out, we're the beta testers. We're adopting this stuff at such a rapid pace. Is that okay? How do we tell these stories? How do we embrace this? And, and, and I, once again, I want to cite Stacy Aldridge, who said, I think this is a great opportunity for libraries to jump ahead. You know, it's, it's like we have the ability to try new things and be the grown up at the table, or my favorite quote from yesterday, we teach people how to be the human in the room. What is it that tells us where, how we can work with this, how we can integrate? And so state libraries are trying to figure this out. Everyone's trying to figure this out. We want to be part of the larger conversation. If you're interested in participating or simply watching, um, this QR code or that URL will take you to something called Circle, which is the Collaborative Institute for Rural Communities and Librarianship. Um, and Slate is one of the working groups or projects within that. So if you're interested in rural libraries or if you're interested in AI, this is a good place. We welcome any questions and obviously before or now. I want to thank you very much for your time and open it up for questions.